uh, can you see that? I don't know whether you can see yeah, that. Yeah, we can see that. Yep. Tell that us what is, that um, is. This, this um, brown, white stuff is mashed bananas with uh, peas. So you boil the peas, then you mix with the with boiled bananas, and you mash them together, and that is um, mixed vegetables. These are all wild vegetables, not planted. This is wild. It's like um, a lot of them look like gooseberries, leaves of gooseberries. It's a family of gooseberries and um, Solanum incinum, which is Sodom zapo. And then we have, um, there is about three varieties of different vegetables there. Did you all see that? Yes. Yeah, so let me just show that again. And um, we don't usually use spoon. We scoop the mashed food and you make a spoon out of that. And then you put the vegetables in and we eat with our hands. But um, we had a visitor today and uh, they don't like using hands, so they, they, they use the spoon. Uh, but um, it's more like a hands thing. Okay, so, okay, Isaac. So while, we're, while I'm introducing you to the class, if you wanna eat dinner, that would be perfectly fine, right? <laughs> okay, so, so I, it is my distinct honor, privilege, and pleasure to take you to Kenya, because this is where Isaac and Joyce Kenjui are. Um, it is 10.30 p.m. They're eight hours ahead of us, so it's nighttime there. Uh, and so he graciously uh, the, said that he would love to talk to this class. So Isaac has hosted Doan students for years. As a matter of fact, he's been on campus several times. He and his wife, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Betty Levitaw, Dr. Betty Levitaw, she taught in the English department. She has a book entitled Africa on Six Wheels. If you've ever had classes with Dr. Brad Elder, uh, Dr. Brad Elder has done some work in Isaac's Village. And so uh, we've had Doan students travel to Africa, to Kenya, and uh, later become Peace Corps volunteers because of the impact that the, of the work that they've done in, in uh, Kenya. We've had students teach English over there. They've hosted so many times. And so because of the pandemic, obviously we're not able to do a lot of our, what we have historically done. But Isaac thought it, that it was just um, I, I'm so grateful that he and his wife are taking their time, their dinner time, to uh, take us around the globe. And I have um, Reverend Dr. Brenda Hayes, who's in St. Louis, who's been auditing the class, has been to Kenya as well. And so um, without further ado, I, this is the Cultural Geography, uh, GG303 at Doan, uh, a mixed okay. group of various majors here. And so yep. uh, Isaac. If you would just tell us some things um, uh, about Kenya, about your connection with Doan, about how you all have handled the pandemic, and also the new app that you told me about uh, money, transferring money, uh, their version of what we would call Cash App uh, that is available uh, for them. And of course, if you all have any questions to ask, talk about the educational system, all of that. Just have a good time with the class today. Oh, great. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like you to meet my wife, Joyce. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm Isaac Kinyanjui, and this is Joyce Nduta. Anyway, uh, starting with names, we, we all have three names, apart from the English one. The English one, of course, is adopted, but um, we have three names, African names. We, are, we come from a tribe called the Kikuyu tribe. And in Kenya, we have about 42 different tribes. 
So the tribe I come from is the majority, the uh, population wise, they are many. And we are basically more business people and farmers. Yeah, so um, my wife and I have got um, four children. Uh, Max is 32 years old. Brian is 27. Uh, Suzanne is 20. And Ashley is 17. Yeah, so I have been working personally um, in the tourism industry. And I've been, I am self-taught. It's not like I went to college, qualified and went on. And I'm, I call myself self-taught because I started uh, working with wildlife since childhood. I know some of you have been the weird kids in the neighborhood. You played with worms, doves, everything wild, frogs, lizards. That was me. So I began to work with wildlife a long time ago. And um, I grew up with my grandfather who knew so much about hubs and trees. And then of course, my dad who had zero education became a tour driver through exposure. And um, I found myself working for a conservation center with George and Joy Adamson, the lion people. I think most of you are not born when that movie was made. And um, it, is, it is called Born Free. And that is where I began my conservation activities. In training, I did my O-level, which is like secondary school or high school. And I didn't go and continue with my education after that. So I, I went and learned through internship. I learned um, with Toyota Kenya in uh, mechanics, motor vehicle mechanics. And that helped me a lot because when I began, I became a driver mechanic in El Samia Conservation Center. I was able to be exposed to experts doing research on wildlife, and I picked it up easily. And after that, I went to Congoni Game Conservancy. And by then, three years of being exposed to El Samia Conservation Center, I was able to know, uh, to, to, to do very well in ornithology. Oh, so I was on. employed. Hold on a second. Did you all understand what he said? That he he uh, picked up his love for conservation through his grandfather. His father didn't have uh, a formal education, but because of Isaac's love for the uh, outdoors, the wildlife, he, he took upon this uh, working in the tourism industry as a driver. And yes. um, and I want to say this too, speaking of the tourism industry and the wildlife, I took Isaac to Henry Dorley Zoo, and I hope he'll tell you about that experience uh, with his yeah. conservation and wildlife and tourism uh, on a, on a um, protective land area in Kenya. So I want to make sure the students could understand with the a latency and translation that I could, I yeah. could bring through. Okay. I'll interrupt you on occasion. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that is all right. That is sawa sawa. Sawa sawa. Sawa sawa means okay. We say a lot of that. We say a lot of sawa sawa. Sawa means the same. And sawa sawa means it's okay. Whatever is happening is okay. So you hear me uh, putting in sawa sawa a lot. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, my, my experience in the zoo, for example, wasn't a pleasant one because I'm used to um, being um, like a naturalist, what you'd call a naturalist. Most of people labeled me because after Congoni Game Naivasha Conservancy, I went to the Congoni Game Conservancy. Then I went to work in Savo East National Park where I used to track wildlife like rhinos and lions and elephants. We would walk and track them to get as close as possible. And of course, as, as, as um, citizens, we are not allowed guns, but we walked with the rangers who had guns. And um, the idea was to get us out of trouble 
uh, not shoot the animal because they are there to protect the animals. So anyway, after that, I came back and worked as a, as a tour driver in Nairobi. And I, that is where I began and I started my own company called Wild Connection Safaris. Yeah, so that is where I met, before I started Wild Connection Safaris, that is where I met Betty Levitov. They came in uh, with students and they wanted to go to the Mara. And we went to the Maasai Mara with them. And my way of um, showing people wildlife is teaching them how we are connected and how we can help wildlife as much as how much wildlife helps us. The, the cycle of life is seen in a live show where you are, when you are on a safari with me, because we got to relate to what is happening there and then, and we've got to know how this wildlife is related to us. And then we, of course, talked about culture, the many different cultures in Kenya, the technology in the country, and how it is affecting the African people. And that uh, brought us together. And eventually, somebody who's never gone to university, somebody who's never done any, anything, I had never, never thought I would ever step out of my country. I was invited to come to Don College and talk about my work, my family, conservation, and different subjects. And I was able, in 2007, was able to have a passport for the first time in my family, somebody was flying out of the country. So you can imagine almost half of the village came to say goodbye at the airport. And um, yeah, I arrived at Don and I was able to talk about various subjects, including having a, a show where a presentation where I showed them photos of my family, of wildlife, my work, and the many achievements. And that is where I met Professor Brad Elder. And uh, we arranged that he would come and do conservation work in my home area. And believe me, we had such a huge impact because when he came over, we were able to collect plastic paper that was being thrown everywhere around. And in my village town, they actually were scared that a lot of people with several foreign people were collecting paper and burning them to turn them to tiles. And the health officers were scared that we were showcasing them not working. And, um, but it helped and everybody began to clean. So plastic paper before it was burnt in our country was everywhere, spoiling the environment, killing wildlife and livestock as well. So yeah, we continued with the relationship and um, in 2008, I was able to come back to Don College and we had another, I had another visit there and we had a lot of discussion. And in 2007, I met Carla Cooper as well. And uh, we talk, I, I did teach a few cl classes. And um, from there, we became family. Any questions so far? Before Joyce says where we met. Yes, so uh, one of the things that uh, was surprising to me, as you can see, if Isaac and Joyce was living in the United States, geographical location of the United States, minus the accent that they were pulled over by the police, they look like black people, right? Uh, Believe it or not, I was the first black person that Isaac ever met in the United States. Yes. Although, although there were lots of Dome students and the connection with, with white folks in the country, he met me in 2007 and it was like, it blew me away. By the same token, my first trip to Kenya, I was blown away seeing all of these black folks everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? It was like, woo, wee, it was just so, and you would think that they could speak English because they look like folks that I knew, right? And by the same token, <laughs> when he saw black folks in America not being able to speak Swahili, it was kind of interesting because you think we could speak <laughs> the same language that the, the Swahili, yeah. which is part of the original language of Bantu, 
which was well before from Bantu, we get, you know, Sanskrit and all of these other languages that sort of evolved from that. So it's an old yeah. language, Swahili, uh, et cetera. If you watch The Lion King and you use the phrase Hakuna Matata, that literally means no worries. In the United States, we have a coffee shop called Caribou. And Caribou is a Swahili phrase for you're welcome, right? Yeah, welcome. Welcome. And so when you see, and we have a lot of co-opting of cultures um, and, and or, or cultural appropriations, as we would call it here in this country, uh, to, the, uh, to the fact that uh, I think it's Dillard's department store has a line of clothing uh, that, that are based on the Masimara. All right. And, and the Masimara or the Maasai, it's the Maasai clothing, the Maasai clothing. There's a line it's called, of clothing. It's called Maasai. It's spelled just like the Maasai people. And so, right. and, and, and it's almost like uh, Macy's department store has a leather purse called Brahmin. And Brahmin is the priestly class of Hinduism. And so you see when people travel around the globe, we pick up and culturally appropriate certain things and might not even know. It's almost like um, body piercing. To have a pierced nose and a toe ring in India shows the world that you're married. Did y'all know that? Yeah, that's what that means. And, and the bangles and everything, women wear bangles and anklets to make noise so that folks will know that women are in the room and there's this level of segregation. So we, we understand what it means when we travel around the world and we pick up on certain things. Even the markings, we call them tattoos here, but tribal markings are indicative of certain tribes and villages across the globe. When you say like the Sudanese have the marks on their forehead as the warriors that you'll see, um, so uh, I don't know, Isaac. You want to talk? You want to talk? Share some more. I don't want to just. I want them to um, hear from you. Can you talk about your house and all of that? I have so many questions. I don't know if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'll let Joyce first of all tell you about where she comes from and uh, how she ma how man this man was very lucky to be. Chosen by her. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joyce. I come from Naivasha. That's where I was born. Uh, being the second last girl of seven children in one family. So that's where I met Isaac. And I married him when I was very young. It was not easy for us to go to school, the seven of us. So my mom was single and would not be able to educate all of us. So I, I got married at 19 and I'm happy to have Isaac with me. As long as we are one, we respect each other and we are still moving on. We later came to our farm in a different county where he was born. We live there in a very beautiful farm. We grow vegetables. We grow onion, onions, tomatoes, and we are making it. So we are happy we have four children and uh, they are all in school. Some of them, Brand is married, Max is married, and the two girls, are, one is in campus doing in KMTC doing medicine and the other one is still in high school and will be doing her final exams uh, on December this year. So, so far, so good. I've been to Don. Carla Cooper is my friend, Betty Levitov. All those are my friends, Brad Elder, and it was fun being there. And I would like to come again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all. Any any question for us so far? Yeah, so how often 
do Kenyan students come to the United States to study? Um, uh, can you repeat that, Kala? Because I, I heard yeah, about he's, students coming. Yeah. He, he said, how often do Kenyan students come to the United States to study? Uh, not as often as American students coming to Kenya for research and studies. But um, Kenyan students, hardly, it is actually a privilege to be able to come to the US to study. And unless you have um, enough money or connections, or you are connected through sports, sports like athletics, then that is, uh, that is a, um, a possible way, but not as often as um, many would want to. So can I say, I want to address that. So that's an excellent question. So in the United States, um, uh, just like if we have to travel to a, a foreign country, we need to have a visa. Um, we, you know, our passport allows us to pass back into the United States. But when we go to another country, we have to have a visa as a visitor or a tourist or even as a student. Most countries have always opened up their doors for United States students to study abroad or to have uh, experiences, but the United States has not necessarily been so open to others to come. And there was a time, so I'll say this, uh, we had a, our 44th president uh, had, had three, three names that was indicative of his, of his global experience, Barack Hussein Obama. Barack is, uh, is, um, is Hebrew. It, it stands for blessings or to kneel. Uh, Hussein is Arabic. And I believe that means uh, uh, something connected with God. And then his Kenyan last name, because of his father being a Kenyan, um, Obama uh, meant something. And so even though his mother was white from the United States and the geopolitics of all of that, he, could, he grew up in Hawaii uh, as a US citizen, we could see that great connection. And so under his administration, and even George Bush administration, there was great opportunity for, for international travel. Even folks could travel to Cuba uh, uh, almost freely as part of the, uh, uh, pretty close to us geographically in the United States. But then um, something happened and our visa process of allowing folks to come to the United States kind of got disrupted. And then it even got a little more disrupted during the pandemic where uh, folks were not able to travel freely for a lot of reasons, especially not sure of the transmis transmission of a virus um, that we that we've all been under, and so the question is, how 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 do Kenyans how how, how many international students does Don have compared to re, to students who are from the United States, and what happens to our international students um, culturally? How do you know when when you have most students who are so used to having fresh food? And then you have to have a meal ticket with Sodexo. <laughs> I mean, how does that work for you? It's a struggle for you, right? <laughs> Isaac, are you there? I think he, he kind of muted himself. So that, that's, a, that's a great question. And we hope we can open up and, and um, be more aware for that. So the point, and I hope he gets back on, um, the point of him going to Henry Dorley Zoo uh, Isaac, I'm talking about Henry Dorley Zoo. So I want to tell him about their first experience. He cried. I'm proud to share the Henry Dorley Zoo. I'm giving it, you know, this is like the second largest zoo in the United States. And they've got all of these things. And, you know, the difference between, he told me this, the difference between an African elephant and an Asian elephant is the ear. The ear is the shape of the continent of Africa. He taught me that. Uh, as many elephants as I saw in Asia, uh, and the, you know, it was so there, the way they looked were totally different than the African elephants that I saw out in the wild. And then to see the zebras and the elephants incarcerated, now we got giraffes in prison. That's the best way I could say it. You know, once you see them in their natural habitat, it will just, you would want to go and free willy, you know. 
all the orchids, just let everything just roll. And, uh, and so he cried. He, you know, he had tears in his eyes. He said, it's just once you see them in their natural environment, there is no scale that we could ever have as best that we can do. And we can say this is for um, uh, understanding animals and to protect them, et cetera. They will protect themselves in nature because of the circle of life. And, um, and so it's a, it's a powerful story that, that I'll never forget his experience um, there. And so if you ever get a chance to go on safari, uh, not just go on safari, but become culturally immersed in the experiences and, and to see uh, all of those things that are there. So I'm gonna give it back to you, Isaac and Joyce. Unmute yourself. You're muted. Unmute. Ah, there you are. And he, they, they talked about farming. So they live, and many of you may have some agriculture background, et cetera. So um, this whole idea of give us this day our daily bread and limited refrigeration. Uh, his food is probably cold. I don't know if you have a microwave. Having access to electricity and to be able to get on this Zoom call that we might take for granted, technology is really a big deal for them to, to take this time and to um, pay uh, this, the service. Okay, Go this ahead. Is, this is our first time to do uh, a Zoom. <laughs> it's, a, it's our first time to do this. So this is very interesting for us. Now, when talk about cooking this is what joyce cooked with i don't know whether joyce you see let me just um can you see that explain it this is this is chaco it is trees that have been cut down and burned into coal what you call coal and then of course you put the fire in the the type of stuff is, is made of clay around here. Can you see my finger? Yes. Yeah, yes. so around here, this is made of clay. This, this is made of clay and this is the fire. So this, this three pieces of, of uh, charcoal will burn for a long, long time because it's not losing heat because of this clay. That's a clay oven. So, yeah, it's a clay oven. So this is what uh, she cooked with today. And um, it's what, um, right now we are boiling water for our bath of the day. We will um, use this water to put it on a, on, a, on a basin and go for in the bathroom and take our, what you take a shower, we take a bath. You, you squat, you throw water over your body after soaping and cleaning up. So it is at night, so it has to get boiled. Um, did, you, did you get that? Because I was like facing the other way. Yes, we got it. And you said you use the water, put the hot water in your basin to uh, yeah. do your cleanup for the evening. Yeah, so after cooking, the fire is not lost, so it boils our, our water for washing up before, before bed. So yeah, so that's um, one of the things to do. Now, let me, let me go back to wildlife a little bit because for me, it was like um, the first time to be in, uh, in a zoo. And to see, for example, um, a giraffe or um, let's see, I saw this lioness that was actually they said she was happy, but to me, I could tell instantly that she wanted to roam and roll around and look at food and chase and be free. That freedom, um, if you've been on safari, if you live here in Africa, you drive from Nairobi to a, to a village and it is about, um, 300 kilometers, which takes about five hours. Um, you, you drive around and you see zebras and giraffes and baboons and antelopes. And the only thing you don't see is lions along the road. But when you go to the national parks, 
where the lions are overly protected, they roam free. And um, the way the lioness was cleaning herself is like she was not going anywhere. She doesn't have any agenda. Every living thing should have an agenda. Every living thing should not be confined to anything. But it is also important because our children would want to learn about wildlife from a place like a zoo. It's got its importance. But for me, it was miserable. And it actually was. I knew, I knew that I was being shown something that was unique. But then again, I felt I wish this lioness was somewhere out there, running away from hyenas, chasing away zebras and buffaloes, and joining a pride. And when you see them, because this is what we do on safari, we don't talk about them like a story, like a National Geographic story. We find them. Once we see them, we learn the characteristics. And because we have learned their behavior, we will tell you, she's about to yawn, she's about to get up. And we look at the fries that are on her, and we tell you the story of how important those flies are on her face. We look at her paw and her tail and her uh, black ears on the backside of, the, of her ears are black. And we tell you about it. We look at the sweaty nose and we talk about that. And we look at her when she gets up and stretches and we tell her, we tell you what exactly she's, prob the probabilities of what she's thinking and where she intends to go. And we look at the weather and the rain's coming and the wind. You don't find that in a zoo. So for me, I knew how miserable they were. But um, yeah. Is it, so can any you other tell, question? Can you, tell yeah. who the mo can you tell which is the most powerful animal in the kingdom? Um, the, there is different categories of uh, power. Well, when it between, comes to the to the, I was gonna say between the lion and the lioness. <laughs> between the lion and the lion, the lioness is the most powerful. Of that of would be um, okay. What is the between the two. Go there for you. The lion only looks good, right, with the mane, it, and all it does is roar. <laughs> but it's the lion. The, pup the, <laughs> the purpose of the mane is to look good, so that you may leave your genes behind. And you, you eat and be strong and defend and fight for the females so that you may leave your genes behind. The, lion, the male lion lives up to 14 years. The female lives up to 18 years. But she feeds him for protection purposes. He eats first so that he can grow bigger and he will have no challenge until he leaves as many offsprings as possible. And the, the females, they are clever. They hunt well together. They kill most of the, of, the, of the food. And also, they incite males to fight when the mating time comes so that she can be able to pick up which one is stronger. So when, and the stronger ones means protection is better and offsprings are stronger. So there is a, there is, there is a lot of, and she's also very light and she's very fast. And if you are to meet the two of them and you're in danger, don't ever pick the female. Pick the male. Because the male will wander for a long time to give you time to run. But the female will pick up so quickly that you are potential food and you are scared and you are not anywhere higher than she is and she will come and get you. And she's not going to do any chasing. So she knows how to scare. She knows how to catch the wind better, and she knows not, not how to show herself. The male, because of the imposing figure, kinds of the ego takes him further and shows himself long before, and then that alerts his, his food, which in most cases, most of the, the males hunt, and they do hunt. A lot of people will tell you they don't, they do hunt, but a lot of 70% of their kill is usually is, is not from them, it's from the lioness. Any question about the lion? Because I wanted to come and see it and we talk about it. And then also, 
if you could talk about um, the social most sociable animal in the kingdom. Ah, uh, the most sociable animal in the kingdom is of course the elephant. The elephant is as clever as we are, and the elephant goes through the same emotions as we do. They get uh, angry, they get sad, and they actually celebrate every little thing like humans. For example, the birth of a child, the coming of age of a male. We do the celebrate the same here in Africa as well. The coming of age of a female, the socialization, the giving birth, the getting pregnant, everything is celebrated with, um, with the elephants. They also communicate in different, different ways. They have the best memories ever. They are very social. They, they rub against each other. They talk about each other. That is all of all the happy boys. That is the most social of all the others. But when it comes to the cat, the lions are the most social. They communicate a lot. They hunt together and they stay together. They also protect each other together. The most antisocial animal, not antisocial in such a manner, more solitary. When it comes to the happy force, it's the black rhino. And when it comes to the cats, uh, it's the leopard. The leopard stays on his own. He is the swiftest of all the cats. There's a difference. When we describe this to a lot of people, the fastest animal in the kingdom, of course, is the cheetah, but the swiftest, the swiftest is a leopard. Just to demonstrate how swift the leopard can be, he is a killer. He can, he's a small animal compared to the lion, but he is, he definitely eats everything. Rotten, snakes, lizards, frogs, fish, birds, everything, kalion, everything, dead animals, he will eat anything. But he's also an efficient hunter. He's so swift and he's so, it's almost creepy. Like you'd probably be seeing an antelope eating peacefully and the next moment he's in the air and gone because the leopard creeps like almost two feet to the animal without the other animal being aware. If you were to take, say for example, 20 people in a, in a room, in an enclosed room, it will take a leopard one minute to open all the forehead of 20 people because that is how they kill baboons. They open their forehead, which blinds the baboon. And because the baboon is also very, very dangerous, um, once it is blinded, it cannot see and the leopard loves eating baboon. So there's a difference between fastest from one place to another running, that is the cheetah. One movement, like for example, in boxing, from, from your hip to hitting that target, that is swiftness. That swiftness, the leopard is the king. But the fastness, the cheetah is the king. In acceleration, the cheetah can accelerate at 110 kilometers an hour. So can so, I ask you, so how, do, how does yeah. all of this relate to humankind? And how if well, animals can live in an environment together somewhat and knowing that there's a circle of life that how can humans coexist with the animals and with each other knowing that the humans are the most dangerous animals on the planet? Yes, they are. Um, Animals don't have, um, I don't care. I don't care attitude. They don't have that. They don't, they care about everything because unless you care about everything, your survival rate is very, very limited. You've got to care about the wind. People don't care about these small things. People don't care about that neighbor is out there on, in, in the cold or in the dust or hungry. They don't do that because it's their business. I will have to mind my own business. I have to bring my children in this manner and that manner. Say, for example, the African social life. We are about the other person almost everywhere. The way we do things 
is like um if i if i was if i buy a car it is not considered mine everybody celebrates everybody comes and congratulates because they know now they have a means to go to the hospital if need be they have a means to take them the distance if they need be and that is how animals are like we um animals coexist in every different way we they get their carbohydrates from each other they get their proteins from each other they get their even when you consider about how they live they get their vitamin tablets from each other believe me it happens when things are so hard when it is so hot like it is now here when it is drying up hippopotamus will eat carrion leopards will eat beetles lions will chew grass so that they can take out whatever hair is inside them and within that hair it will feed some other animal so the cycle of life itself we had we humans be, uh, had a disconnection now I can tell you about my experience. When I came to Nairobi versus when I was in the wild in Savo East, East National Park, I could smell an elephant from far away. I could tell that's a male urinating, that's a female urinating. I could tell the difference. Right now, just the other day, I was trying to figure out whether our, our cow is pregnant or not and if you could before in Savo East National Park we could tell when an animal was pregnant simply by smelling and looking at the the the, the urine that's it because we knew about we learned about this scent you, you you grow in the world i was there for 5 years i even almost lost touch with my family because i was there depth in depth uh trucking rhinos trucking lions trucking everything you got to know about the smell the wind the the feces the the spoor you know like the the footprints everything there is a disconnect now that we are all um our natural senses are are gone and with our natural senses our sense of each other has also disappeared we no longer depend on this is going to happen so we need to get ready for that we already know there is a storage somewhere so believe me um uh, there is a lot you can learn if you are to come to africa in many many ways and in the way we live that is why i encourage a lot of students we encourage to come and please come stay with us learn how we live understand how we view things and then let's go see animals and see how how similar we are actually we actually are any questions so far cuz i can talk for a long time <laughs> any questions how far do we have to travel to see the wildlife okay what question is how far you have to travel to see the wildlife and then we have another question How far, how many kilometers, how far, how long does it take for you to go see the wildlife? Um, from, from where I am, um, like, um, was it last week? Like, sun, like last Sunday, but one, last Sunday, but one, we had elephants walking by our home. <laughs> and um, and um, driving from here to going to Masai Mara would take uh, from home, it will take about um, half a day. That is why you go to a conservation area specifically left for wildlife, but it is not fenced. That is how important, uh, that's how clever animals are. It's not fenced, but they know to keep within their limits. But the others that are used to human beings like zebras, giraffes, and a lot of antelopes like impala, wildebeest, kongoni, all of these, uh herbivores stay and intermingle with livestock very easily elephants will go to a place that the ancestors went 
for many, many years back. When we settled here after independence, my grandfather used to work for a white settler. So we were given land here. And um, before that, they used, animals used to roam everywhere. So there is a family of animals. Their descendants used to come and drink near our a river that is close to us. So every young one comes and gets taken to where they used to go for many, many years back. So they go to the same area over and over and over. And there is um, a forest nearby where they used to have elephant graveyard. A certain, certain families used to come and die there. It is a flat area and swampy and it has soft grass. So when elephants are over 70, they no longer have got any teeth. The morals don't grow anymore. So they come and chew the soft grass. A family will go to the same area for many years and they used to die there. So a lot of um, white poachers and uh, a lot of colonial poachers would go and find these elephant graveyards and they would think that that is the, the, the place that people would come and hide their tusks, but it was an ancestral graveyard for elephants. See how similar we are. So, yeah, so in terms of kilometers, I can also go for two hours and go to Na Nakuru National Park, which is one of the most important conservation area where black, white rhino and black rhino are surviving very well. And this is the place you go and see the flamingos in their thousands. And there is also lions and leopards there. But there is no cheetah because this, this, the park is too small and there is no elephant because the park is too small. But the other animals are there. And also I can drive for another four hours and go to Samburu National Park and Mount Kenya National Park, which is also got different types of animals and is as beautiful as the Maasai Mara. So the national parks, as he's saying, if you take it out of the context that we would have our national parks, if you see Yellowstone National Park, multiply that times a thousand, and that would be where we would have these various um, animals in nature. And it's a national park because it's protected. You can't poach, you can't, I mean, that's against the law anyway, but they were, yeah. there were some poachers who would take the rhino's tusks and, and for medicinal purposes. And it would, it would um, kind of, I mean, that's so evil you know, knowing that the tusks are for something for that purpose, that animal's protection. Same thing is with the, uh, the ivory tusks. Um, and to, to just go and, and do those sorts of things, it's just kind of not so nice. It would almost be like, well, how would we feel if someone came and chopped our arms off and then put them yeah. on display? I mean, that happened too during electric times, but you know, that's the geopolitics. That, we've got another question. You got Kind of that's when you were talking about putting some of the enemy stores to up in Omaha. Um, I was wondering that since you um, were talking about how you kind of where you work at the um, uh, conservation kind of area, if you there went up to the um, just outside of Omaha, there is this little conservation area they have like wild buffalo and all that that kind of just are roaming around that area that they have that you can drive through. Yeah, we didn't we didn't go to the see the wild buffalo, but we did I did take it to the Pioneers Park. But I want to I wanted to talk about this is something that, that I learned in Kenya. The water buffalo, you know, they're like the the big eight, I think that's their they're called the big eight when you go on safari to see the lion, the rhino, the hippo, the water buffalo the um i don't know i can't name the other three uh, uh the other yeah. four but anyway um the water buffalo um if you re if you know anything about uh history especially the british and, and even africa the parliament you see the people it's interesting that we're in the supreme court justice nomination week for the first black woman nominated to the supreme court but the parliament of these various countries, 
they had wigs. You know, the wigs party, W-H-I-G. Yeah. Remember that in history? The wigs party. <laughs> well, the wigs, and, and, and if you go back in American history, you could see some of our politicians with the wigs on. Well, those wigs were based on water buffalo because water buffalo are quite powerful, right? Can, uh, yeah. Isaac, yeah. That, the, that those wigs, and then you, you compare the way that, how goofy folks looked at history, now, that was the magistrate look that showed great yeah. power. The water buffalo are quite powerful. If you could talk about that and then some parting words because our class is wrapping up and we want to thank you. So uh, if you could talk about the water buffalo a little bit and any, any other encouraging um glad you survived the pandemic kind of stuff anything uh yeah. as we end yeah um you, you've heard about the big five in africa the big five is um um is not necessarily the size so the hippopotamus is not there the giraffe is not there and, and it is um the 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 black rhino the elephant the leopard, the, the African buffalo, or the kid buffalo, or the water buffalo, and the lion. The reason is, is that during the colonial times, these animals were the most dangerous to hunt. And so they contained the most precious trophy. But amongst them, the most dangerous animal is the water buffalo. Um, they go in a herd in a huge herd. They are gregarious, which means they eat together, they socialize together. But the bulls who have grown older and are weak are usually left aside and they form a butcher herd. And this butcher herd is usually the oldest and weak, and not necessarily weak, but oldest buffaloes who stick together and let the young ones continue with the, with the lineage. And um, when they become very dangerous when they are in their butcher herd because they have lost the protection of the herd and they have also lost grazing ground. And so lions and people will pick them up because they are isolated and they know this. And a buffalo will see you and hide and wait until you've shown your back and come charging. And once they hit you, they don't know how to stop. It is also the only animal that cannot be domesticated. People have brought baby buffaloes at their home. And when the horns grow and they begin to meet in the middle, which is what they call a boss, they, it gets to be itchy. And when they bang on you, they don't stop. They don't know how to stop. So they continue and kill you. And once it kills you, it will kill again. So even lions, we we'll need to be more than four lions to be able to bring down um, a one ton buffalo. A buffalo weighs about one ton. That is nothing compared to the hippopotamus who weighs about three and a half tons. And that's nothing compared to the elephant who weighs seven tons. So that is why the buffalo is, is, is very, very dangerous. So we were highly affected by the epidemic. The epidemic that hit our, um, the whole world um, definitely uh, destabilized the country. But there was a lot of, a lot of misgivings because uh, in the rural areas where people are used to eating wild vegetables and wild berries, there was very limited infection. And if so, the people had almost like but by the time we had the second hit, we were like thinking, this is no more. This is going to happen again. I think the government is lying to us. There is nothing like that. But um, we witnessed a lot of death. And um, the, the, the medication to reach the rural areas was harder. So a lot of the injections hit the towns first before they came to the rural areas. And of course, it all depended on your political leader and how effective they were with the government. But um, people actually were very much affected because we are used, for example, greetings to us was shaking a hand 
vigorously. Hugging is common, very common to hug. Kids are hugged and, and lifted up and prayed around and thrown up and, and you know, held back and prayed around with. This was not happening. Churches, there was no one. But the people got together in terms of prayers. They would meet together and um, call each other and say, at um, nine after dinner, we are meeting, we are praying, we are all praying for a certain thing. And most of the time was this epidemic would go away. And so social life, uh, phones were used more often and washing hands became so like, it was, it was more like not a thing to wash hands every time. It was not a thing to, to sanitize and to cover your face. We, uh, we, we communicate a lot, by the way. Everyone does that in the world, but it is more red, more, it is more red in terms of what is happening in your life. Are you okay by the smile, the way you smile, by the way you laugh, by the way you do these things. And these things were, people missed these things a lot. So the epidemic brought in a new way of living and a new way of, um, uh, we wouldn't say hygiene in that sense, because of course uh, there was a lot of uh, diseases that were brought up by, um, so we had a lot of stomach problems that actually disappeared. People are not going to hospitals for other ailments at all. For one was for fear that you might be tested and um, be found with one. And it was so, so expensive to get oxygen. Leave alone the fact that in a population of about um, 500 people, about 300,000 people, you might find two or three hospitals with a few oxygens. So that was like very, very limited for the number of people who went to the hospitals. Yeah, so um, on a parting shot, I would lead a, I have been able to come to Dawn and I've been able to talk about so many things. And um, I still feel that there is a lot that I need to talk to, to talk about. And I still feel the most important thing for this world to heal is to travel, to see other cultures, to learn about other cultures, to learn the importance of respect. Everything here is based on respect. Respect for not only for each other, respect for each other's space, respect for what other persons feel and respect for a lot of things. So respect in many of the tribes in the country is the basis of this of a lot of society. So yeah. So on a parting shot, I would say, God willing, and you want you will be meeting. You have a lot of America is multicultural. Um, just respect that one culture. Travel and no. And um, we, uh, Mama Max, I, I found it interesting because when I came to the US and Joyce came to the US as well, we, we, we give, as a sign of respect, I call Joyce, not Joyce, her name. No, I don't call her by name. I call, I call her Mama Max, which is a sign of respect, mother of Max. It means mother of Max. So that is a sign of respect from every, every, every age. Even if a child who is fit to be my son's child, they will call us grandfather and grandmother, even though we are not related. That is respect. Sawa? Sawa. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Sawa. Thank you. Sawa means okay. And Karibu, of course, is welcome. Jumbo is very dualistic for hello, but um, the um, the slang for hello is um, sasa or uh, VP. VP means what's up. VP. <laughs> VP. What's up? <laughs> so there, there, yeah, there is Karibu, Karibu. Welcome. Thank you so much, Isaac. We uh, greatly appreciate your. Uh, Isaac and Joyce for taking your time out to 
join us for the first time via Zoom. How about that? Uh, in Kenya. <laughs> so you want to give them a great caribou? <laughs> Santi, Santi. All right. See you soon. See you soon. We'll talk. Thank you so much. Okay. okay Say hello you. to all your families. Say hello to all the families. I will. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>